assalamu alaikum everyone uh, welcome to obi talks and uh, joining me today on obi talks uh, is uh, naomi heverland from uh, florida united states of america uh, naomi is uh, an artist she does murals street art 3d paintings and i think she paints on canvases as well so so we'll get to know more about her so thank you naomi for taking out time and uh, you know joining me for obi talks thank you thank you for having me so uh, so naomi since i know that uh, you're an artist and i don't know much about you myself so uh, please tell us about uh, yourself your background how long have you been uh, you know involved with art in general and uh, then uh, did you do it as a child or it was something that you you know discovered later on did you have a professional uh, training as a professional artist or are you a self taught artist and um, how did you get into street art was it a planned thing or is it an accident how did it happen so i been doing art all my life like as a kid that was just what I felt like I was best at so I always felt encouraged to continue practicing art um I don't have professional training I started doing murals when I, my kids were babies and I was trying to find a way to earn some money and so I started doing murals that was in Utah and it was like mostly murals in homes, nurseries, stuff like that. Wasn't really making that much money off of it. But then I moved to Denver and got more into the fine art scene. Started working on canvas a lot and showing um, in galleries, um, mostly lowbrow galleries, nothing like um, very prestigious. And then, um, I started doing the Denver Chalk Art Festival, which is a really big event in Denver. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of artists will take one of their pieces and just reproduce one of their pieces onto the pavement for the festival mm -hmm. because the festival has so many people and um, spectators. So I started reproducing one of my paintings every year at the Denver Chalk Art Festival. And that's how I got connected with other chalk artists. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably eight years ago, I guess. And then four years ago, I moved to Seattle. I never did the 3D chalk art before I moved to Seattle mm -hmm. because I was um, in Denver and Chris Carlson was in Denver. Denver. Do you know Chris Carlson? Uh, yes, yes, I know. So he's like just amazing at 3D chalk art and I didn't want to compete with him, but I did work alongside him a lot, really learned how he was doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I was really fortunate to be able to do that. So then when I moved to Seattle, I decided there was no one else there doing it. So I decided to try out the, doing 3D chalk art there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he helped me out a lot, even from a distance. Um, just with the logistics of how the optical illusion works and everything. Um, and that's when it kind of took off um, because no one else was doing it there and people were pretty impressed with it. So mm -hmm. I started doing like a weekly piece for Amazon on their like courtyard. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yeah, I guess once you do the 3D and you see the optical illusion, it's just really addicting, I think. Um, like to try to master it even better. So, and then also I think just uh, culturally that um, that art form is taking off because it plays into, you know, pe selfie culture, mm -hmm. social media so much. So I think that's why it's been taking off a lot more. Um, so really my training, I think just, I mentioned Chris Carlson, but other artists too have just really helped me along the way because um, I go to festivals, meet international artists and get advice from them. And I'm, I'm constantly messaging other artists asking for advice. And um, I try to also pay it forward to artists who are not quite as far along as me. Mm -hmm. So really, I think I've just learned mostly from other artists not really professional training, just experience in other artists. Right. So are you working as a full-time artist now or 
you like uh, do it as a side hustle so what's your you know heart routine is like so oh, it's a little complicated right now but like i mentioned i started getting into art when my kids were babies but now both of them are adults like so my daughter's 18 and my son's 19 so they are pretty independent now and so i kind of have the ability to travel more and um so yeah i'm doing it full time for sure now um i do murals chalk art um and then painting commissions like portraits and stuff like that um but yeah i, I don't have like a set nine to five schedule that I do it. But um, I mean, if you added up the hours, yeah, it's full time. Right. So uh, this just brings me to another question. I, I have been following your work for a while now. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a particular uh, style that you have in your uh, artwork, like be it uh, the color schemes, beat the imagery that you choose like uh, i found your work to be you know it's it, it has a lot of humor as well and then uh, the, like you said the color scheme so what's your design process like like uh, i've seen also seen that you paint a lot of marine life as well and uh, i actually i think saw one of your videos where you were using uh, you know to get the design ready you actually used clay modeling clay and you built up models and everything uh, and then you photographed it and then uh, you, you went, went on to create uh, a 3d art so what's your design process like and uh, let me you know attach one more question to it so do you like to more uh, mostly commercial works uh, or uh, they are like uh, the kind of work that where you get to do what you want to do so what kind of works that you do and how do you you know get your style of work into you know the paintings that you do okay well i'll start with my design process and um <clears throat> my design process is definitely very messy like i don't have a very structured or systematic way of designing things and i feel like in a way it's definitely detrimental to me because I um, don't have a system to follow and I'm always just sort of floundering around waiting for some inspiration to hit me <laughs> and then even when inspiration does hit me trying to figure out how to accomplish that um, I feel like is one of my biggest struggles and so yeah sculpting with the anamorphic art you know as you know you have to have it you know from a very very particular angle so you have to either be able to illustrate that on your own or photograph something an object or something so um, a lot of times yeah i do sculpt it first to try to get the form of it and then take that photograph and digitally paint over it but also because i'm also really particular about lighting like any of my pieces that turn out good is because I had good lighting. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like lighting is so hard to predict. Like, I know that some people are able to illustrate stuff, but like certain like nuances with the light, the way that like reflective lighting comes off the different hues and stuff is so hard to just predict it out of your head. So yeah, I, I am typically dependent on a photograph to be able to accomplish that. But something that I really want to get into is 3D modeling because that could really be helpful. Um, and uh, one time, are you still there? Yes, yes, I'm here. I can hear you. I think we're frozen. Let me know if you can hear me. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, OK, yeah, now I can hear you. Um, so one time, I I don't know if you saw one of my recent pieces. It was the milk crate challenge piece. Did you see that? Uh, yes, I think I saw it. I think it saw it on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, like so, it's like a bunch of milk crates stacked. Um, but I was like trying to figure out how to accomplish that. Mm. I was like, I have milk crate to photograph all that. Um, and so I went on to Reddit and I, there's a Reddit site called 3D Modeling Requests. 
Mm -hmm. and I requested for someone to 3D model it for me. And okay. within 10 minutes, I had like three people willing to do it. So I had someone 3D model it for me, which was just amazing. They did it perfectly and everything. And so seeing how well that worked really makes me want to maybe learn 3D modeling on my own. Mm. Uh, so uh, sorry, sorry, sorry to cut you off. So I have uh, another question that I wanted to attach. So do you use like uh, technology as well? Like I, I have seen many artists. I've been talking to different artists, uh, and uh, I myself I use uh, some softwares as well. Since I have a background in architecture, so I try and you know. Uh, get my designs and everything uh, done in uh, some softwares that I use and then uh, I try and get resolve as many issues as possible from uh, you know lighting to the distortion that's going to happen and uh, the sizes and everything uh, even the scale person how big the artwork will be so everything that is uh, resolved and then uh, many artists i've seen use photoshop as well so do you use any of those uh, software as well like you've said that you want to get into 3d modeling but uh, since i also do not know 3d modeling but uh, I use some architectural softwares that uh, help get the you know illusion correct. So, do you use any of technology as well? I mean, mostly I'm just doing everything on Procreate on my iPad. Okay. Um, but I just saw yesterday they announced that in their update they have a 3D modeling uh, feature in their next update. So I. Definitely want to check that out today because that could be really helpful. Right, 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 right. So yeah, so it's like, uh, there was another question that I asked. So Sim, do you do more commercial works or uh, uh, like the, where or the works where you get an opportunity to you know express yourself and you know uh, do your ideas? So please tell us about it. Yeah. So. Uh... It's like interesting because, um, you know, a commercial work is kind of where the money is typically. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's one uh, incentive to do commercial work. But yeah, I, I always enjoy artistic freedom way more. And a lot of times the commercial work is kind of stifling as far as, uh, as far as like the style and stuff. And especially because I enjoy things that are a little more wacky. Mm -hmm. um, and so like a lot of times with the commercial work, they are just like wanting something really basic that you've seen so many artists do before, like a hole in the ground again. So mm -hmm. yeah, I like, I mean, I like a combination if there is commercial work where they have like a company backing it or funding it and they, but they are open to, um, you know, something a little, they're open to taking risks with the artists. I enjoy that most, but um uh, yeah, it's a combination of both. Um, I guess I, I'm typically commissioned before I start the work. I haven't done in a long time a piece where I'm just doing it on my own and then trying to market it after the fact. I haven't done that in a long time. Uh, so one more thing, like I said, that uh, the imagery that you paint is uh, kind of surrealistic and it has uh, humor as well. And uh, I've also seen you paint a lot of marine uh, life as well, like you paint a lot of fish. And uh, so what's the thought behind it? Like, is it something that you, uh, you know, something that uh, you have a connection with? Uh, like the other day I was talking to an Ronin and uh, she... Uh, generally uh, her works are very playful and she paints a lot of toys and stuff and candies as well of late so, <clears throat> so she told me about that um, it's a connection from her childhood that she you know tried to replicate it in her artworks so is it something for you as well uh, that you you know paint uh, marine life a lot or is it just a random thing um I don't know. It's hard to like, it's hard to like boil down what attracts me to certain subject matters. But yeah, I love, I feel like marine life is like sort of magical. And so I'm always attracted to that. And then also um, marine life uh, tends to have some 
fun textures to reproduce. So like I am constantly looking for things that are gonna have like really dynamic textures when certain lighting hits it. So oh. like I just did a fish um, and this sort of goes to my last um, question or the last question about my process. Um, I did this fish holding a frying pan. And so my process was I actually went to the grocery store and bought a snapper okay. and then photographed it. And um, what I liked about that was the wetness of it. So it would have some really fun highlights on it. Mm. So yeah, marine life does seem to have really fun highlights. Um, and then I, I typically want something with a face. Like I hardly ever do something that doesn't have a face because I feel yeah. like that's the best way to connect with, I feel like it just ends up being more, um, more animated or I don't know, like it connects with people better if it has a face. Um, so I don't know, but I, I do have like this whole shelf up here. I don't know. This is just going to be audio, right? You don't have video. No, it's going to be a video as well. Oh, it is, okay. Here, I'll show you some of my reject <laughs> sculptures. Yeah. Like, uh, like I'm usually when I'm like trying to like figure out what I'm going to do, I start like sculpting something. So like <laughs> this was my trying to get some inspiration for my armadillo. Nice. This one was, uh, Someone wanted it a doll hmm. anamorphic mural. Um, th th <laughs> this is like really, I, I think I broke the beak off of this one. <laughs> so okay. All of them are rejected. Like I didn't end up using them. Well, I, I guess I did sort of use it. They, hmm. they usually get somehow, but um, yeah. So, and, and then I don't know what to do with them. So I have all this junk around that I've been using for inspiration for, for my art. <laughs> But yeah, um, I don't know. I, it's hard to say what attracts me to things. And usually it's not, I don't really like something with deep like philosophical meaning or something. Mm -hmm. I like hardly ever can like explain some deeper meaning in, in my artwork. I really just want it to be something that when people look at it, they enjoy it. Like I, I always prioritize the visual, the visual impact over the like, the impact of the meaning behind it. I just want it to be visually stimulating and enjoyable. Right, that's that's very very interesting to know. And uh, because I've been talking to different artists, and every artist has a uh, very different process, you know, when coming up with designs. So it's actually one of my favorite questions that I ask everyone that uh, what's their design process like. So uh, since you've told that uh, you did not have uh, any, you know, training as an artist or you didn't go to any art school, typical art school. So how did you, you know, uh, uh, you know, learn about different materials? Because I also do not have uh, any training at art school. So uh, I had difficulty, you know, learning uh, or, you know, experimenting with different materials. So how did, was it difficult for you as well? And, uh, you know, how did you experiment with materials? Because since you are sculpting as well, and uh, there are different materials are different, and you can feel the texture and everything. And uh, similarly, when you're painting, uh, there are a lot of variety of materials available, mediums available. You, you have water-based materials, you have oil-based, and then there are chalks as well. So how, how did you start? Which material did you use to start with? And then what materials do you use to work? Uh, do you use uh, nowadays? So please tell us about it, the material. How did you, you know, learn them, uh, learn to use them? And what do you use now? So I started with acrylic paint when I was doing murals. So, and it was just, yeah. And I kind of just learned through trial and error, sometimes mm. on people's walls, which I, I really embarrassed about some of the, some of the things I did in the beginning of my art career. But um, so I think I got really, I really refined my acrylic painting skills. And a lot of that is just muscle memory, knowing like blending and stuff like that. Just so I like doing it over and over and over again, you get really good at knowing your hands know what to do more than your brain. Mm -hmm. um, and then I transitioned into oil because I just realized um, I took a workshop um, with 
Daniel Sprick. I don't know if you know that artist. He's a portrait artist, but just like hyper realism and stuff. Okay. And that workshop, I think I really realized that in order to get the intense colors, I would need to learn oil paint. So, and I kind of gradually transitioned from acrylics to oils. I started out just putting like a thin layer of oils over the top of my acrylic painting. And then like slowly, you know, the, the ratio of acrylic to oil is now, now I do mostly oil if I'm working on canvas. But I have noticed like in my um, studio, I have like a whole stash of tempera paint, a whole stash of mural paint, acrylic paint, oil paint. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I have all these different stashes of different kinds of paints. And each time I'm switching between them, I do feel like this sort of um, like cur learning curve e every single time. And I feel like it's like switching between languages. Maybe you would understand that being mm -hmm. multilingual um, where your brain has to sort of like switch over onto a different track or something. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I do feel like um, maybe if I had stuck with just one kind of paint, I would be better at that one kind. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I've, I've often wondered that, like, because I'm, am I hurting myself by switching between all those different kinds of paints? Because each one of them is different, dries differently, mm -hmm. blends differently. Um, but uh, I guess it's worth it in the end because I'm able to do it in so many different contexts. Right. Uh, very, very interesting, actually. Uh, so, uh, this I, I had this question that uh, you, you since you said that uh, a lot of your learning happened at uh, festivals, especially the Denver Art Shop Festival that happened. So, uh, do you go to like uh, a lot of festivals now, and have you been to festivals in Europe as well? I have not been to any in Europe. I really want to. Um, I think I got invited to one before COVID happened and then they canceled it. Mm. So um, I think it was Germany. I don't know. And then also I've been kind of restricted on what travel I can do based on what my kids need. Um, but so now I, I'm hoping in the future I could do some European ones. I've done some in Mexico and Canada. Um, and then of course the United States. Um, and I guess the, the, the festivals, I kind of look at them as a like career development investment because you know, you don't make money going to the festivals. I try to make sure that I'm not losing money. Like my expenses are all paid for, but mm. I do feel like I, m my, you know, skills progress so much by interacting with other artists seeing especially when it's international because I think that that like we kind of get into our own little bubbles of artists based on our country or whatever we're like sharing little tip tips and tricks between the American artists or whatever but when you're interacting with international artists you like get such more of a wide variety of tips and tricks so um yeah I, I look at it as an investment in my and it's just like networking too like um talking to all these different artists. And I, I just love all the camaraderie as well. It's like super fun to to get with other artists and talk about anamorphic art or chalk art or whatever. It's really fun. So it's a social thing, but also an investment in my skills. Right. Uh, since you mentioned that, uh, COVID, you mentioned COVID. So has it like had any effect on your art practice? Like I was talking to earlier in the year, I was talking to Tracy and uh, she said that uh, she got time, she got time to, she had some projects that she wanted to do, but uh, wasn't able to do. And COVID helped her do that. And uh, like, uh, for instance, the museum that she just opened, and I think you've uh, painted as well, I think. The, yeah, yeah, I did go out to her New Jersey museum and do two pieces there. Yeah, so like she did that. And uh, similarly, I was talking to Jenny McCracken from Australia. She similarly said she got time to work on her, uh, you know, paintings on canvas so that she can, you know, 
put them up in gallery shows. Uh, similarly, different artists, uh, you know, most of them said that they actually got time off so they could work on their studio practices. So did it have any impact on your art practice? And uh, was it a positive impact or a negative impact? I mean, it's, it's really hard to gauge the impact just because you don't know what would have been if COVID hadn't happened. Yeah. But um, basically COVID led to me moving to Florida from mm -hmm. Seattle. So Seattle was, their schools were going all online and it wasn't working for my daughter who was uh, going into her junior year. And so I wanted her to be in school for her last two years of high school. So I moved down to Florida. I have some family here and um, it just worked out. There was a bunch of circumstances that lined up and worked out. So moving to Florida was a result of COVID and that's had a huge impact because there's a lot more chalk artists here in Florida. I was pretty isolated up in Seattle as far as chalk artists. I was, I had other artist friends, but chalk artists, street artists, I didn't really know anyone up there. So moving to Florida has um, led to me being able to interact with more artists. And then also it makes travel a lot easier like you don't realize how far away Seattle is. Like every flight would be like at least five hours. And like, like here, uh, just about every flight I've done is like under three hours. So it's just a lot more doable. And then the time change problem, all that. So Florida is definitely easier to interact with more artists. Um, but as far as, uh, I don't know if I, yeah, I think at the beginning of COVID I did get a lot more time in my studio, which was nice. I did a couple commissions, um, some portrait commissions. And I remember that was really nice being able to just focus on that um, and uh, and listen to the news about COVID <laughs> while painting. Um, but yeah. Right. So uh, since uh, you've been, you've spent like eight years or so, uh, you know, doing uh, street art or uh, you know 3d art or anamorphic art or murals in general so where do you like uh, see this uh, art form going uh, in the future like uh, since now there are a lot of uh, museums opening as well i've seen uh, they're opening in europe as well they were here in uh, you know malaysia and thailand they were here but uh, now they're opening in Dubai, USA as well. So, uh, and you've worked as well. I think you've worked in uh, two, three of them. So uh, how was your experience working with them and what kind of feedback? Because uh, in, made, in museums, the artworks are more permanent of permanent nature and on the street or on, in the street art festivals, they are of temporary nature. So what kind of feedbacks uh, from audiences have you been getting? And uh, like, is it like a good thing? Uh, or uh, is it like uh, what kind how, how do you gauge it and because in festivals people uh, actually get to see the process of uh, you know the creation of paintings because in different uh, festivals when uh, people come and they get to see how the artwork comes to life but in museums this won't be happening so how different would it be from the gallery shows that uh, generally happen because people there are there is a certain disconnect between the artists and the people and in the chalk festivals and street art festival that disconnect you know does not happen but how do you see this uh, going uh, in the future that uh, will it have in uh, a negative impact that people do get to enjoy but uh, but again, they don't get to see the artwork come to life. They do not become part of the creation, process of creation. So how do you see it, uh, you know, evolving in future, street art or 3D art in general? Yeah, I mean, what you said um, makes sense that the festivals really have more of a emphasis on connecting with the artists, learning about the process. And um, these museums are really a, a lot more geared towards maybe the teenage selfie culture where they really don't care about the artist at all. They just want a picture of themselves. <laughs> so, um, I, and I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like in a way the artists are uh, really 
um, trying to figure out how to connect with that person best, figure out how they are going to want to take their selfie and like trying to like almost like key into their vanity. Like, how can I um, help this teenage girl take a picture of herself the best? Like it sort of cheapens the art in a way. Um, but also it's a challenge to figure out how to connect with people and how to have them be interactive with the art. Like, I feel like when we're not thinking about adding a person into the artwork, it was so much easier. All I have to think about is what do I want out of this art? Not trying to figure out how somebody else will connect with the art or interact with the art. So it's a challenge. And I think that, um, I'm always really impressed by certain artists that are so good at that, like like Eric Grinwald, like he knows what is going to connect with people at that time. And he's always doing something very timely that will like really connect with them that week. And if you did it next week, it wouldn't. The week before, it wouldn't. Like he's really good at knowing what will connect with people right then and there. Um, like uh, um, Sean McCann, he'll come up with something that he knows people are going to want to be a part of. And I think that's a challenge and a skill that you got to develop. Like you got to think deeper, like what's going to connect with these people. Um, but also I think um, we're kind of lucky that, um, that this art form is so marketable right now mm -hmm. with TikTok, Snapchat, all those cultures. Like it's just really a good time to be doing this artwork because it's so marketable. So um, yeah, there's like goods and bad. Um, I, I think also like murals used to just be about like in the moment and now they're geared toward how do you take a picture of this mural? Right. Um, so, and I see street art going that way. Oh, well, and even festivals as well. I've noticed that in the last few festivals that I've gone to, hmm. like more than half the people are doing the 3D as opposed to the 2D, whereas before it used to be, you know, you had a key, a couple of key 3D artists and the rest were doing 2D. So it really is just taking over. Um, and I think it's because of, you know, the culture right now, the social media culture. Um, so in ways it's, it's, um, it's good and bad, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, so we are coming towards the you know end of our um, session, and uh, I've really been you know and really you know enjoyed listening to your perspective on different things, and especially uh, your training part. So, uh, one last question I have: Where do you see your art going in the future? Like, I think you do gallery, you do shows in the galleries as well, like you mentioned earlier. Uh, so. Uh, do you see yourself doing more uh, street art murals or uh, 3D art in general, or is there going to be a transition uh, that you can you can see happening uh, with your art that you'll be more gallery oriented, your art will be more gallery oriented. So, or if you have any other plans, like where do you see yourself going uh, in the future or your art in general? I wish I knew. Um... But uh, my physical um, health, I think, will limit me some. Mm. Um, doing the street art on the ground is just like really taxing my knees, my back. Like, so anytime I'm given the opportunity, especially like at a festival, to be doing something vertical, I try to take that opportunity just because it um, takes less of a toll on my body. Mm. Um, so yeah, physical, I have that limitation, but I hope I get to do more murals. Like I feel like I have some more murals within me that I need to let out. I have to tap into those. I, I, I'm, I don't feel like I'm done. I don't feel like I've done everything I want to do. So I'm hoping there's more opportunities. Um, I guess I'm excited to see what opportunities arise. Um, and then, but yeah, at some point, I think I'll probably, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, like in the far future, yeah, I will probably transition to painting more in my studio. Mm -hmm. um, just because I think that's a natural progression with artists. Um, so, but I don't know. I hope that I, I hope I don't stop learning and 
and pushing myself and getting challenged by things. I hope I don't start, stop doing that because that's just like what motivates me to, that motivates me to keep going at all. So, yeah. Right. So uh, wish, I wish you all the best with the, you know, whatever uh, you try in your future and uh, whatever future holds for you. So thank you very much, uh, you know, for taking out time. Uh, if you uh, if you have anything you wanted to say and I didn't ask, you can, you know, say it now. And uh, I just want to thank you for you know, taking out time and, you know, joining me uh, in doing this. Thank you so much. I, I mean, I have admired your work for quite a long time too. Thank and, you. And um, every time something of yours pops up on my feed, I'm always super impressed. So um, it's an honor to be able to talk to you in person. Yeah, thank you. And I, ho I hope we get to meet sometime as well. And yeah, uh, yeah. so thank you, you again. Think, do you think you'll be coming to any US festivals? Uh, there was a plan, uh, I think, uh, two, three years ago to visit uh, the Sarasota Festival in Sarasota. I was in touch with uh, Denise. Uh, she even, you know, uh, sent me all the documents that were required for the visa and everything. Because in Pakistan, we have a quite, uh, uh, you know, lengthy visa process. So... Uh, but unfortunately, during those years, I was in touch with her. I uh, had to travel to Germany for festivals in, uh, you know, August and September. And then the festival in uh, Sarasota was happening in November. So it didn't give me enough time to make the, you know, application, visa application. So, um, so let's hope that, uh, you know, something works out and uh, I, you know, get to travel to festivals in the uh, U.S. as well. Because I've yeah. tried festivals in uh, Europe. They have a different uh, atmosphere, different themes. And uh, I've seen uh, and heard about festivals in the U.S. And so obviously the audiences are different. And I've worked in Middle East in Dubai Canvas Festival. So I've had uh, the interaction with audiences there. So I would, you know, definitely love to travel to US and see and the audiences interact with people and see how, 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 how it is to work there. I think we're losing connection. Uh, can you hear me now? I hear you now. Yeah. So, so thank you again. Uh, I've taken a lot of your time. So thank you so much for uh, taking out time. And it was really okay. nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Good talking to you too. Yeah.